spacelidar.jl which is a Julia package for processing iSET2 and JDI satellite LIDAR. So, hello Martin, can you hear me well? I can hear you well. Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you perfectly fine. So, uh, we have a couple of minutes so that we can test your audio and video and slides. Okay. So, I can hear you well. I have uh, added your slides also. It looks great from my end. Well, if I can start, let me know. OK, yes, um, we can start in another 10 seconds or so. I'll introduce you, and then we can start. Thanks. OK, so thanks, Martin, for joining. Uh, a quick introduction about Martin. So Martin Pronko uh, is a geodata scientist working on global terrain modeling at Deltaris which is an independent institute for applied research in the field of water and subsurface. Martin is also an external PhD candidate at TU Delft. So the stage is all yours, uh, Martin, and we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks. OK, thanks for having me. Um, I'm presenting spacelighter.gl today. It's a Julia package. Um, this is the software track but I guess it would have fit in the use case track, remote sensing one, uh, or even the academic track as well. Um, in a sense, this is also a continuation of the talk me and Martijn Visser gave uh, back in Bucharest. So that's 2019 Phosphor G, uh, already a while back, which was also about Julia. Um, and today I'll talk a little bit more about my use cases and how I use Julia and, and this package. So some context uh, of why using Julia and, and why this application. Basically, um, Deltaris, the research institute I work for, uh, does a lot of modeling. Um, and we, well, we try to make the world a better place. Uh, our model is enabling Delta life. And for enabling such a thing, we need a lot of good measurements. And especially, we need good elevation measurements. Uh, and this is critical for uh, calculating the risk of flooding uh, for sea level rise, but also subsidence, landslides, and I think multiple hazards or other analyses that you would run. I have a picture here. Um, this is the Bikini Islands in the Marshall Islands. Um, it's famous or infamous for its atomic tests, but it's also infamous for uh, the fact that these islands are disappearing completely, uh, probably within the next century. Because this island has a maximum terrain height of three meters above mean sea level. And we fear that with the current sea level rise, this island will disappear completely. It's already flooding on high tides or uh, storm tides. So having good elevation data is, is critical for these kinds of uh, research analyses. However, if you then look at the current data sets that we have, if you look at the elevation data sets, and they're famous, they're SRTM, um, the Merit is improved version of that, you have ALOS, um, but actually all of these data sets are radar based. And well, that's great because radar is active, it will penetrate the clouds and measure the surface. And so you can also fly by night. Um, most of the radar bands uh, will in some way measure mostly the surface of the earth. And surface means, apart from bare terrain, it also means the canopy of, uh, well, basically the canopy, uh, and also buildings and other infrastructure. And you can see that here as an example here on the right. This is the southernmost tip of Vietnam, so Mekong Delta, very low-lying area. And here in red are some areas that look quite high. I mean, they're more than 10 meters high here. It's actually clipped, uh, same as, as here. These are basically the last remnants of probably some mangrove forest there. The rest has been converted to, well, might be fish ponds and other um, agriculture. Um, but these red blobs, basically, they're the top of these uh, canopy structures. And you can actually see some stream structures in between there. Uh, but you can also see other patterns, namely that along canals, like on the topmost part of the picture, 
there's a lot of buildings going on along a canal. Um, and this is all measurements or at least part measurements from atop uh, the buildings. And what we want is the, the actual terrain to see what kind of impact uh, we can have here. And normally we use LiDAR. So instead of radar, LiDAR is using a laser. Uh, we normally fly around with planes, but this is very expensive and it's not doable for the whole world. So it's only been used for, um, well, I'd say most of Europe, the USA, uh, New Zealand, but not so much, if at all, in uh, Southeast Asia. Luckily, since 2018, since the launch of ISET and JEDI, so ISET and JEDI, I've got to say ISET 2, are two LiDAR satellites. So normally these are radar missions. Now we have lasers in space, which is in itself already very cool. Um, ISAT is a single photon LiDAR. So it's, it's a discrete LiDAR. It gives you a point on the surface and dot, dot, dot. Um, it was meant for mostly ice sheet monitoring. Uh, so it's in a polar orbit. Uh, and I have that here on the top picture. You can see that the blue orbit here takes you very high to the uh, 90th latitude, basically. So it really can monitor the ice caps. JEDI, however, it's attached to the ISS, so it's bound to the ISS orbit, and you see that it basically stops right at the latitude of the Netherlands, so 51 uh, inclination here. Um, and JEDI is mostly meant, it's a full waveform lighter, so instead of discrete single points, you get a full waveform of the canopy or other structures it's hit. Um, and it's meant for ecosystem monitoring, for biomass, um, a lot of and really focused also on the tropical areas. All of these uh, the, these these lighter missions um, they will measure terrain, they will penetrate the canopy and actually reflect off the ground or reflect of something. So you can measure the terrain from space, which is incredibly cool, because uh, we also have uh, very high accurate data from it if you filter it. I see now this is a slightly older presentation because I crossed out the actual numbers, but these are sub-meter accuracy for ISA 2 and roughly around the meter for JEDI. Uh, and in flat areas, uh, eyes and the poles, these numbers get even better and go down to centimeters. However, there's a drawback and you can already see it here uh, in the top down picture. Um, you have the tracks here. Uh, and normally with a plane and lighter, you start flying around until you reach let's say a full coverage. So the plane is flying almost in circles. A satellite, it's bound to its orbit. And so it will fly with a kilometer or more per second uh, and will fly in a straight line. Luckily, the LiDAR is divided into beams. So you'll have multiple straight lines over the Earth. But you can imagine that it takes a very, very, very long time before all these orbits will eventually um, start filling up a very dense pattern. They probably won't do that. And you will have gaps in between these uh, tracks of a few kilometers. And that's basically what you see here. So space lighter is great in terms of accuracy. Um, and again, this is a part of, uh, this is now satellite background. This is still uh, part of the Mekong Delta. These are the ISA tracks laid on top of uh, Google Satellite. And you, you can see a lot of detail already here. You can see how coastal parts are slightly higher. There is a clear uh, height above a city somewhere. Um, but what's most painful here in terms of coverage is that you can have gaps here. And these gaps are multiple kilometers. If you're lucky, like the smaller gaps here, they're less than a kilometer now, um, which means that's roughly the resolution that you can get if you only use space lighter data. So this data is very sparse. Now, if you want to work with this data, you need to download um, a so-called HDF5 file. You might be familiar with them. It's a very popular format, especially at NASA. But your normal GIS tools will probably not handle that. Also, you need to um, make a subselection of all the granules there are. So all the ISAT data is, and also the JEDI data, it's the divided into smaller parts called granules. 
So I need to have a subselection and then you need to download that data. Keep in mind, this is a lot of data. So the data that I'm showing here, if you download that for the earth completely, you're looking at 14 terabytes and there are even higher level products than that, that would easily hit petabytes. Um, so you really need a subselection or work together really well, maybe with NASA or have some giant cloud infrastructure to do that. Also, these files needs filtering. And I think it can really use some conversion to, let's say, the formats that you're used to. So GeoTIFFs, shapefiles. Well, we shouldn't use shapefiles. Let's go to GeoPackage uh, and maybe last file. So that's a point cloud format that you might be familiar with. So this is basically the use case for spacelighter.gl. Um, so I will now try to give a small demo in a notebook uh, demonstrating these capabilities. And I've built Spacelighter, this Julia package, on top of GeoArrays, GeoDataFrames, and LesIO, which, uh, which are also Julia packages, uh, partly by myself, which are roughly akin to REST IO in Python and GeoPandas in Python. And I think LastPy would be also a good comparison. So let's now switch to my other browser. Um, I have here a notebook. Could do a Julia notebook, a uh, Jupyter notebook. Uh, but this is now a Pluto one. Um, the syntax, it's Julian, but I think it's quite readable. And users of Python might feel right at home, MATLAB users as well. So to start, let's import Spacelighter to use. And then let's select a bounding box. Here I define Vietnam, um, a really rough bounding uh, box. And then the first functionality of spacelighter.gl is actually trying to find, like I said, the correct granules. So here we search for ISA2. You could also type in Jedi. This is a specific data product that I already showed you. It's a 100 meter resolution version of the elevation data. I put in the bounding box and I put in the version, the most recent version at the moment of this data set. And this will find you using NASA Earth Data Search, um, a, well, a large number of granules, in this uh, case, 466. And these are all different granules. And if you look at a single granule, it has a certain ID, it has a download link that could also be a local path, and it has some info. So in the file name, uh, there is actually uh, some data encoded. Right? It's quite readable, but you have to know where to split the file string. And you can see that has a certain um, ground track, uh, a certain cycle and segment. It's a certain version and a revision. Um, and you can also see whether this is an ascending or a descending orbit. Um, and now we can download one of these uh, granules. So if you want to download, there's a helper function to do that, but you need uh, a NASA Earth Data account, both for ISA2 and JEDI. So if you want to use this, uh, please register. Uh, and you can put these credentials in the NetRC file, um, or you, I have a helper function for that as well in Spacelighter to make such a file easily. It's basically plain text of your user and pass uh, that you need to download. So if I then say, uh, let's um, download the first granule. Uh, so I'll get the first granule uh, out of the list and download it. And I get the local path. So this is my local user. And then in the notebooks folder, I now have this H5 file locally. So let's take a look at what's in there. So HD5 files are very nested. And this package is really opinionated about what data it gets and what data it doesn't. It's really focused on getting elevation points out of there and it will automatically filter based on the most common quality flags. So let's import data frames, which is, well, just almost the equivalent of the one you're familiar with in Python. And then we call points on the granule. We also include canopy points and then we call data frame on it, and then we concat these data frames. The reason that we have multiple data frames, which is a broadcast operation here, so we apply data frame to all the 
tables we basically get out of here is that in the previous slides, I've shown you that there are several tracks per product. So you get each track individually, and that's what you see here. I basically mesh them together into one big table. And you see we have roughly, for a single granule, uh, 75,000 points. You also see that the Z value is actually none. Um, and the uncertainty that we have here is really great. So this is basically uh, the no data value. You see we decoded the timestamp, and we have a quality flag, um, and also some uh, signal no noise ratio in there. It would be great to actually filter some of these data. So if we move down, let's say we filter this data frame that we have on the signal noise ratio and uncertainty. So we just try to clamp this data and then we get a smaller table, uh, only 38,000. So slightly less than half of what we had. Uh, and you now see that we actually have Z values uh, and uncertainty is way lower. So these are good points to use. Now that we have this, I think it's time to actually put this in somewhere where it's more usable. So let's try an export. So I'm now importing GeoData Frames, which again is like Pandas. I create a point, uh, so a geometry out of the XYZ columns, and then I use data frames to write this to a geo package. And that's what I get back here. So that's all that's needed to basically uh, export a table. So this table on top of here was completely unaware. It was not geo pandas based or anything. Um, not aware of any geometry. We create a single column and now we can write it to a geo package. And it will hit automatically based on the geom name column. Um, if you don't want uh, a geo package, you can also import lasio and do exactly the same thing and write uh, a las file uh, to disk. Do not, however, I like the last format. I'm all for it, but um, the last format only supports a very limited amount of attributes. So, well, uh, those attributes are kept in a geo package because you can have unlimited attributes. Less IO, most of it, it's gone. Um, so it's only, if you're only interested in XYZ, you can use it. And lastly, um, we can import geo arrays. Uh, but as you understand, we now have a table of points, so vector data. So we first need to interpolate it into a raster before we can actually uh, make that. So what we do here is we set up an empty raster, uh, just zeros, roughly in the shape of the bounding box. We actually set the bounding box on this uh, raster, and then we set the coordinate reference system, which is here on EPGSG code. We call interpolate, which takes the table of points and writes it to the geo array, and then we can write it to a TIFF. So now you have a test TIFF on disk. Um, but to easily visualize that, we call using plots, and then we plot here uh, using a heat map function that single geo raster. And what you see here is you see three tracks. There are actually six in there, but because of the resolution of this raster, they're already meshed together. Um, so this is a single ISAT track over Vietnam, probably part ocean here. So this is roughly the functionality of Space Lighter in a nutshell. And I will now switch back to the presentation. And um, let's continue a bit. So as you could see, um, the data that we had is very sparse. And if you interpolate it, you already get some no data values. But what you can do is actually uh, make a resolution that does fit the data. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, so back in 2020, we published uh, a coastal elevation model. Uh, we called it the Global Lowland DTM. Uh, it's a five kilometer resolution, but it already showed that much of these um, deltas, especially in Southeast Asia, are way lower than previously anticipated because we're using radar elevation norm um, uh, models normally. And these LIDAR models, even at five kilometer, will really show you that these deltas are way lower than we thought. And this is a big risk. So what's up next? I'd say future work is taking uh, 
existing radar data and start fusing it uh, with ISAT and JEDI. So in the picture I showed you before, I can go back to it quickly. Um, this is a current, this is unedited tandem mix data, 30 meters over Vietnam. And if you use ISAT and JEDI, um, you can probably get that to a way better level. And you see, this is a quick result that uh, first of all, it's much lower. And you also see that much of the completely red areas are, uh, well, are filtered away. Uh, however, this is a work in progress. So as you can see, there's some weird stuff going on around here. And here is some remnant still off canopy. So it's not 10 meters high anymore, but we're uh, doing better already. So this is a work in progress and I will continue doing this. Um, in the meantime, updating the space lighter package with the work that I do. Um, so from Dotaris, this is all about open sourcing uh, the data and software. Uh, so we do research in a very open way. This is roughly my presentation. I want to acknowledge uh, some important people. First to me, I uh, sadly heard the news that Martin Isenberg, the inventor of Last Tools and the Last Format, passed away recently. And he has been a big inspiration for me already during my student time up until now. I want to thank to uh, NASA and especially the LPDAC and the NSIDC, which are hosting the JEDI and uh, ISAT data. And they're hosting the data in a completely open manner. So we can make free use of it uh, and make great elevation models. So uh, kudos to them for enabling open science. And last but not least, I want to talk, uh, thank Fisser and Jishin on GitHub, who helped me a lot with uh, Julia, Julia packages, and also the driving forces behind the GDAL uh, conversion to Julia, uh, behind all the packages I just showed you. Um, so, any questions? Hello, Martin. Uh, thank you so much for the great presentation. It was uh, very insightful. And coming from the same uh, LiDAR community, I could relate to it very well. So it was very nice. And as Thanks. you said, yeah, it is very saddening news to know about Dr. Eisenberg, because I still remember when I started my PhD, I got mm -hmm. his best wishes that you should uh, do your school well. So yeah, we, we pray for him and his family. So we have uh, some questions for you. Uh, I start okay. with it. So first question is, um, which I had uh, also in uh, during the presentation, that mm -hmm. have you done benchmarking with Python and R libraries? So we have this Python libraries, I think PDAL, last by Open3D, and then LIDAR is also there. So any benchmarking with those libraries? Uh, benchmarking of the geospatial libraries? Not directly. Um, I, I don't want to go into um, a benchmarking fight between Julia, Python, and R. I'd say if you find the language to your choice to your liking, please mm -hmm. use it. I'm not saying you should convert to Julia. Um, the reason we chose Julia, uh, it's already an older one, is that we started to work with point clouds. Uh, it was not me, it was actually uh, Visser, uh, who I mentioned in the talk. Um, he worked with large point clouds. And he noted that the Python code that he had wasn't quick enough to actually work through those millions and millions of points. Um, of course, there's a great alternative, and that's PDAL. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, kudos to the guys of PDAL. They're great. Uh, they're here at FOSS3G. I know them. Um, but not everyone has the capability to move to C++. Mm -hmm. And I think Julia is a nice in-between of getting that ease, like in Python. So if you want to do a custom thing, um, you normally do it in Python, maybe, and then if it's too slow, you switch to C++. I think you can do both in Julia and, and stay there. And that's basically why we got an geospatial ecosystem in Julia. Um, and if you do standard work in Python or R, please keep using it if it works for you. Um, if you run into trouble in terms of performance, because you might have to generate the whole world, well, Julia might be a nice option. Yes. Okay, thank you. 
So the next question is, uh, what is the temporal revisit time of ISAT two? Ah. And, uh, um, it's a, uh, it's actually uh, a difficult question because both Jedi and ISAT are able to uh, slightly angle the beams that they point. So they're slightly pointing away each time, uh, so they get a maximum amount of coverage. I, I believe normally it's like not ninety days or something. I um, yeah, I, I think so as well. <laughs> but uh, th this is, it's uncertain. Uh, I'd say really check the data uh, whether you have a revisit over your area. Uh, and this is, of course, a problem of these data sets. They're already very sparse and they're not guaranteed to revisit a certain uh, point. There will, there will always be sparse areas, spar uh, data that won't be filled. Yes, uh, maybe, but even better than the terrestrial uh, scans, because in that case, it is up to the vendors to go and collect the data again. OK, so the next question is, uh, what is the horizontal accuracy of JEDI and ISAT 2? The horizontal one, yes. Um, so the beam width of JEDI and ISAT is, uh, I believe, roughly around 15 to 17 meters. So a normal lighter from a plane, it, it's like it's, it should fit in your hand, basically, the beam that, that comes down. Um, but you, it's basically the same from space. I mean, space is further away, so it becomes wider and wider. So the, the beam footprint is, I'd say, keep it around 15 to 20 meters. Um, and then there is a, a few meter horizontal um, accuracy. Uh, it's in the meters. It's, it's way bigger than the vertical accuracy. Uh, but again, these are, uh, especially the horizontal accuracy is improving constantly, uh, because in the newer versions, I think version two of Jedi, they improved it by a factor or something. So I'm, uh, I'm slightly hesitant to say this, but I'm mostly ignoring horizontal accuracy because, uh, of course for validation data, you see the papers, um, they actually try to move the beam, uh, around to see where they get the best match. In, in waveform, uh, in simulated waveforms, or just to get the terrain a bit better. But you can't do this in a random area of the world where you have no validation data. So I use it as is, um, but it will be, especially in, in steep areas, it will be a, a source of uncertainty and error. OK. Uh, the next question is, uh, how easy is to create custom filters for the ZI data? And it follows by, say, if you are interested in the full waveform values and biomass information. Good question. At the moment, it's uh, for me, it's really about, uh, and, and thus the package in my research, it's really about the discrete points. So actually, the full waveform data, I believe it's not even in this product that I'm, I've shown you now. Uh, and I don't support all the data products yet. However, this is open source work, so I'm, I'm happy to hear what part of uh, or what uh, data version you're interested in, and we can probably uh, make something in Space Lighter. Definitely, that's very motivating. And do we have more questions? Because we have some time left for questions. Four minutes, I see. Great. OK, so I don't see any further questions. So thank you so much, Martin, for the presentation. It was very insightful. And thanks. have a great 4 g ahead. Thanks for hosting. You too. Thank you.